Great. Okay. Well, welcome once again to tonight's webinar, Witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses, What You Should Know. Uh, again, hosted uh, by myself, Jerry Robinson, uh, founder and director of Jerry Robinson Ministries International, and uh, interestingly enough, a former Jehovah's Witness, uh, someone who wants to share with you uh, my understanding of, of this, this false cult, this false religion, and what you need to know to empower yourself when dealing with a Jehovah's Witness at your door. These people come to your door uh, with a zealous spirit. I tell you, they come out uh, every single Saturday morning. I used to be one of them. It's astounding how zealous they truly are and how sincere-hearted they are. Do you remember when Paul talked to uh, the, uh, the people in uh, Athens? And he said, I see that you have a zeal. After God, he saw all of these different gods in the uh, temple. And he said, I see that you have a passion. But there, let me tell you about this one unknown God that you don't have a name for. That is the same spirit that I think that we should bring to these Jehovah's Witnesses because their zealous uh, nature, their passion for the truth, even though they're misguided, is very real. They desperately desire to know the truth. And we have the truth if we believe in Christ and have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. And uh, that is our good news to share with, uh, with the world and with Jehovah's Witnesses. Obviously, tonight we're talking about witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses. Upcoming webinar topics, by the way, just a brief uh, commercial here. We're going to have some uh, leading in times of crisis. Boy, that's a good topic to, to talk about right now. Uh, the road to one world currency. Is a one world currency coming? You better believe it is. We're going to talk about that in an upcoming webinar. A precious metals update, gold and silver. What the heck's happening with those? We're going to be tackling those. And also another um, apologetics topic because it does play into geopolitics quite a bit. The rise of Islam, what you should know. We're going to talk about some very interesting things about Islam that will really benefit you uh, in your walk. Again, remember JRMI, we're here to educate, equip, and empower Christian believers around the globe on the topics of geopolitical, economic, and cultural trends and how these trends will impact them in the global church. We're challenging believers to think and thinkers to believe on the web at www.jrmi.org. Let's get to tonight's uh, webinar kicked off, Witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses, What Every Christian Should Know. And let me start off with three questions that I'd like to ask you. And these are really rhetorical. We're not necessarily expecting any firm answers. But if you do have a specific answer to any of these, feel free to type them into the question box. I'd love to see them. Number one, how many of you have encountered Jehovah's Witnesses at your door? And I would assume that a large number of you uh, more than likely have. How many of you have someone that you love in Jehovah's Witnesses? And I would assume that, uh, in fact, last time I was, uh, we did a webinar here, we found that several people did. Um, and then finally, how many of you have won a Jehovah's Witness to Christ? Has anyone ever done that at the door? And if you have, I'd love for you to type that into the, into the question box over there so we'll be able to see it. Um, and uh, I see Dee has made the comment she has tried, but no. Dee, that's a great point because trying with these people is pretty much the best that most people can do because they seem so brainwashed in their, in their views. Uh, Shannon says yes. Shannon, you actually have won a uh, Jehovah's Witness to Christ. Praise God. That's awesome. If you have any uh, further elaboration on that, feel free to type it in. I'll get to it in a few minutes. By the way, if you have any questions as we go along, feel free to type those in the question bar over on the right-hand side of your screen. Okay, so good. So a few of you have won a Jehovah's Witness to Christ at the door, perhaps even through maybe a coworker. It's a very difficult thing, but we're tonight we are going to talk about several different things. First of all, we're going to give a brief overview, and I'm going to give you my story. Uh, that's going to be very brief, just tell you a little bit about my background in Jehovah's Witnesses. And then we're going to give a brief history with facts about this cult. We're going to find out what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. And then we're going to ask, why is the Jehovah's Witness at your door? Why does the Jehovah's Witness seem so confident when he's standing at your door? What can you do to impact a Jehovah's Witness at the door, even in your nonverbal uh, uh, movements, and then what should you say to a Jehovah's Witness at the door? Tonight, I'm going to show you a verse and a passage of Scripture 
that if someone would have showed me years ago, I would have been dumbfounded. Do you know that when I used to go out to knock on doors at the age of 14 and 15 and 16 years old, I believed that I was doing a very good thing for Jehovah's Kingdom. I was very zealous. I wanted to share my knowledge of the truth that I thought was the truth with the unbelieving world, and especially with Christians, because I believed that Christians were so completely deceived. And when I went out to speak to people at the door, very few people actually had anything to say to me besides hateful things or slamming the door in my face or, you know, the typical things that you normally see uh, or you would expect. And I became very callous to those things. Tonight, I'm going to show you an approach that if you will use this, you will find that your success rate with dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses at the door is going to skyrocket. And if you are a pastor, I know there's at least a couple, I saw three pastors in our list tonight. Uh, if you're a pastor, I encourage you, I implore you even, take these techniques from a former Jehovah's Witness and use them to share with your congregation. Don't listen to somebody who's never been a Jehovah's Witness before when it comes to this, although they may have good things to say, and I wouldn't say don't listen to them at all. But certainly take into consideration someone who actually has been in these shoes. i got to tell you, you're going to see a pretty big difference tonight in our approach. Our approach is going to work with these folks. We desperately want to see them saved for Christ. Let me tell you real briefly about my story. My grandmother was converted to Jehovah's Witnesses as a teenager, and then my mother uh, was converted as well, obviously, and then me. Um, I remember as a child, um, very, very solemn uh, birthday, because uh, as a Jehovah's Witness, there is no such thing as having a birthday. I didn't have any birthday gifts. And by the way, don't break out your violins. It's okay. I've already been to therapy. I've got through all this. Don't worry. But I didn't have any birthday gifts. And look, this isn't just me. This is anyone who's involved in Jehovah's Witnesses in general. No Christmas gifts because Christmas obviously is pagan. No saluting the flag. When I went into my classroom, I, would actually sit, I actually had to sit down during the Pledge of Allegiance because I considered, well, the Jehovah's Witnesses had taught me that I was dishonoring God and worshiping a, an idol if I were to lay my hand over my heart and salute the American flag. So I remained seated in my classroom. You can imagine the tension that I felt many times. I even had one teacher that would send me out of the room. She was very patriotic, and she said, no one will sit down while we salute this flag. So I was very... Uh, it was a very, very strange time whenever I was a child trying to live this Jehovah's Witness lifestyle. I couldn't participate in school plays. Never understood that one, but that was something I wasn't allowed to do. Couldn't be involved in martial arts. Couldn't be involved in boxing or wrestling because what would Jesus do? Would Jesus box? Okay. No Boy Scouts. Wasn't allowed to be involved in that. Missed out. Still can't tie a good knot. I was discouraged from attending college uh, when I was young by the Witnesses because the times were short, the days were short, and we should spend all of our time focusing upon spreading Jehovah's Kingdom by knocking on doors. I couldn't be a police officer. That was also a strange one, but apparently Jesus wouldn't walk around with a gun and a holster, and so neither should I. I could not serve in the military, so I was forbidden from, from doing that. Um, I, was <laughs> I was not allowed to buy Girl Scout cookies for whatever reason. I, that was a Weird. That's even weird even just to, just to say. That's so strange. Could not read Christian literature. Had to stay far away from a King James Version of the Bible or any type of quote-unquote Christian literature. I was not allowed to listen to Christian music. Um, could not attend a Christian church. Could not own or wear a cross. Was discouraged from playing chess. Still don't understand that one either could not join clubs or sports teams. By the way, this isn't something that I couldn't do, but just kind of an interesting point. Jehovah's Witnesses meet in places called Kingdom Halls. They don't meet in churches. They meet in places called Kingdom Halls. And these Kingdom Halls have no windows. Very strange. I could not give Mother's or Father's Day gifts, which that was very strange. Um and was forbidden to say, God bless you, when somebody sneezed. That was actually pretty much taboo. 
So I was baptized at the age of 15. I had to go before a panel of elders, and I had to answer over 80 questions about the Bible, about Watchtower literature. Um, Watchtower, I'll explain what that is in a few minutes. And then I began training in what is known in Jehovah's Witnesses as the Theocratic Ministry School. And that's held every single Wednesday night in which Jehovah's Witnesses train their young and their old alike in how to deal with people at the door. The Theocratic Ministry School is what this was called. Now you can imagine, uh, as a young man, I had a lot of questions. And the more questions I began to ask as I began to get older, the less satisfying the answers became from these people. Obviously I was searching for truth, and Jehovah's Witnesses didn't quite have the truth that I was searching for. Before we go on, let me check the question box here very quickly. Just bear with me as I look. Okay, looks like we're doing we're doing well. Okay, if you have any questions, feel free again to just chime in. Okay, well, let's continue. The uh, the marks of a cult. You know, before I knew it, I was beginning to question whether Jehovah's Witnesses were really the real deal or were they instead a cult. And let's discuss really quickly the marks of a cult, and then I'll tell you what happened uh, uh, to me, and then we'll talk, about, uh, we'll talk about some other things related to Jehovah's Witnesses. First of all, when dealing with marks of a cult, they typically believe that their group holds the monopoly on truth. They believe that somehow they have received an enlightened word, and them and only them, they and only they, have the monopoly on truth. That is one of the very first signs that you're dealing with a cult. Be very careful when you get into an environment like that. Number two, the cult typically believes that God only speaks through them. Okay, we're going to we're now be careful now as we go through here and measure Jehovah's Witnesses against each of these. Number three, marks of a cult, they tend to believe in more than just the Bible. In Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, they have the Watchtower magazine and the Awake magazine, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. You've ever been to, in, uh, with Mormonism, Mormonism, they have the Book of Mormon. Um, and so these types of cults, they always have additions to the Bible. They believe in more than just the Bible. Number four, they tend to, to target uh, true Christians for converts. Uh, the purpose of cults is to divide the body of Christ. That's why Satan sends them. They preach what the Bible calls another Jesus. Uh, they preach what the Bible calls another gospel. And, and Paul warns about this in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4. You know, if you ever hear stories from missionaries who go out and travel around uh, the world, they'll often tell of going to the unsaved and preaching the gospel and they'll finally get a church going in some small village, and then lo and behold, here come the cults. You know, so we all need to heed the warning in Scripture, keep your eye on those who cause divisions among you and turn away from them. That's what it says in Romans 16, verse 17. So they often target true believers with their falsehoods. Uh, one thing I was thinking about back on point three, too, by the way, is that uh, it says additions to the Bible. One question to ask or to keep in your mind as we go through, has anyone ever become a Jehovah's Witness simply by reading the Bible alone? If you just read the Bible alone, does anyone become a Jehovah's Witness? And of course the answer is, of course not. It takes their special literature or their special viewpoint to help you craft your view as a Jehovah's Witness. Number five, marks of a cult, they teach works based salvation. Always watch the salvation message. And in Jehovah's Witnesses, their salvation message is simply this. It's grace plus works. And we know from Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 that it's grace by faith alone in Christ and in the finished work at the cross that we have salvation. It is not due to our works lest any man should boast. And then finally in Marks of a Cult, always pay close attention to their view of Jesus Christ. 
A tainted view of Christ and his finished work at the cross is almost always where cults go astray. Remember, if we have the right Jesus Christ, we are right for all of eternity. But if we have the wrong Jesus Christ, we're wrong for all eternity. And we're going to take a look in just a moment and see the view of Jesus Christ that Jehovah, Jehovah's Witnesses actually have. Um, and i got to tell you, I was even thinking about the Mormon view of Jesus. And we're not going to talk about Mormons, obviously, tonight. But Mormons believe that Jesus, you know, remember what Mormons believe? Mormons believe that Jesus was born in heaven as the spirit child of Elohim, which they believe is the heavenly father, uh, by one of his wives. They believe that Lucifer was Jesus' brother who became Satan, and that Jesus is one of many gods. So obviously, the cults typically begin with a, with a straying from the biblical view of who Christ really is. Okay, let's talk about Jehovah's Witnesses' beliefs and their doctrines. Uh, Jill chimes in real quickly and says, what's the difference between Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons? Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons really are uh, drastically different in their viewpoints. Uh, maybe perhaps we'll get to that in a few minutes. I just explained the view of Jesus uh, from the Mormon viewpoint. We'll explain the view uh, from uh, the Jehovah's Witness viewpoint in just a second. Let's take a look at the Jehovah's Witnesses' beliefs and doctrines. First of all, we have the Jehovah's Witness founder. His name is Charles Taz Russell. He was the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses movement. He was an American evangelist, uh, often referred to as Pastor Russell. He was born in 1852. He died in 1916. He was an American evangelist from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and he founded what is known as the International Bible Student Movement. Now, he was born in a Presbyterian family, and as a teenager, he became jaded with the Christian faith. So here he is as a teenager. This is obviously a young picture, a picture of young Russell, and he became jaded with the Christian faith and he began to investigate other faiths, such as Buddhism and Hinduism, and none of these stuck. But in 1870, at the age of 18, by the way, there's an older picture of uh, Charles Taz Russell, uh, whenever he was older, near, near death even. But uh, in 1870, at the age of 18, young Charles Taz Russell entered into a, uh, uh, a sermon um, given by a man by the name of Jonas Wendell. And he was a spirited preacher in the style of William Miller from the old Millerites uh, back in the day. Uh, Wendell claimed Christ's return would occur in 1874. And this sermon represented a monumental shift in Russell's life. Apparently, he left this sermon with a renewed zeal for the validity of the Bible and of the necessity to preach the gospel. So he no longer was dabbling in Buddhism and Hinduism after he heard Jonas Wendell speak and he heard him talk about the coming of Christ, he, he immediately got back to the, to the basics and began researching the Bible. Now, over the course of several years, Russell and his Bible students believed that they had identified and corrected many errors in the Christian church. Russell and his followers taught several different things. Number one, they taught no concept of a burning hell. They believed in total annihilation. So, when someone dies, they're completely annihilated. They're not put into a burning hell. They're not put in torment. But instead, it is complete annihilation. Number two, they believed after reading Revelation, the book of Revelation, that they discovered the truth that only 144,000 people who are righteous will enter heaven. The rest of this great multitude that is talked about in Revelation would inherit the earth. Uh, number three, they denied the, the doctrine of the essential doctrine, I should say, of the Trinity, the idea that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all three distinct persons, yet they're three in one. Number four, Russell had a fascination with 1874, obviously uh, brought about by Jonas Wendell's uh, uh, proclamation that Christ would return in 1874, and uh, he calculated 1874 as the year of Christ's second coming until his death. And he maintained that Christ was invisibly present in ruling from the heavens. And in 1914, Christ would take over the earth. And so his view was that 1874 to 1914 was this prophetic time where Christ was ruling from the heavens. He had, he had returned invisibly. And that in, on, on, uh, in 1914, Christ would return visibly 
and he would set up his kingdom. Um, and of course, he believed that he was God's special messenger. That's what all these guys end up thinking. They think that they have, you know, they're God's gift to humanity, and they've they've brought about this brand new message that no one has known for the last two thousand years. Now, Russell obviously had a stroke of luck because if you know from your history books, what happens in 1914 is World War One breaks out. One of the, but the biggest war up until that whole time. The biggest war ever, World War I. It breaks out in 1914, and he interprets this as the outbreak of Armageddon. And so obviously the zeal and the passion for his teachings obviously begins to skyrocket, and people begin to get very interested in what Russell has to say. Now, of course, those dates were wrong, and there was obviously more false prophecies later, but 1914 really became the, the year that really surrounds Jehovah's Witnesses and really begins the inception of what we know as modern Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, one of the more interesting points about Russell was his, uh, and l l before I do that, let me just show you this real quickly about what Russell believed about himself. Here is a scripture um, where it says uh, in Luke, uh, and I believe it's 2145, who really is the faithful and discreet slave whom his master appointed over his domestics to give them their food at the proper time? Well, pretty soon in the Watchtower, uh, in the 1916 uh, uh, edition of the Watchtower, here's what it says. Thousands of the readers of Pastor Russell's writings believe that he filled the office of that great faithful and wise servant and that his great work was giving to the household of faith meat in due season. His modesty and his humility precluded him from open, openly claiming this title, but he admitted as much in private conversation. So they began to anoint him as the, the, as the wise, uh, the faithful and wise servant, the faithful and discreet slave, as it says in the New World Translation, which is the Jehovah's Witness Translation, which we'll talk about momentarily. Okay, so we see here all of a sudden the self-proclamation that, that uh, Charles Taz Russell is the man of God that has come to bring all of this truth to a truth-starved world. Now, um, here's what we see, and this is classic Jehovah's Witness style. This is exactly what they do. Look here, a 1973 retraction of this. Here's what it says. From this, it is clearly seen that the editor and the publisher of Zion's Watchtower disavowed any claim of being individually in his person, that faithful and wise servant. He never did claim to be such. Okay, so here we have, and this is just the first of many that we may not look at tonight, but you'll see as you look over and over in Jehovah's Witnesses wit a literature, they'll say something and they'll retract it. If you go back and you look at 1914, they are building up uh, talking about how 1914 is going to be the year that Christ returns. Guess what happens when it reaches 1915? They recalculate the date, and they say, we were off by a year. It's 1915. He's going to return in 1915. Well, then they said, well, we never said it was 1914 or 1915. What we meant to say is that it was 1918. So they began to pound the pavement and say, it's 1918. Well, 1919 rolls around, and what do they do? Well, they say, look, if you believed it was 1918, you were completely foolish. We never said it was going to be 1918. We meant to say that it was 1925. 1925 is when Christ is going to return. So what happens when 1926 rolls around? Well, then all of a sudden they say, you know, we never said it was 1925. We said instead that it was 1975. So 1975 rolls around, and people are selling their homes, and people are not going to college, and many people are, are basically selling everything they have because, because Jehovah's kingdom is going to be brought to the earth in 1975. What happens at the end of 1975? thousands of people leave Jehovah's Witnesses, completely disheartened. So we have this track record of false prophecy after false prophecy, and here's such an early one here where obviously there is, there is this talk about how he is, Pastor Russell is this, this uh, messenger of God, and then we see a retraction just a, several years later. You'll see this all throughout Jehovah's Witnesses um, uh, literature. Now, one more interesting point about Russell was his strange fascination with the pyramids. He had a very strange fascination. In fact, believe this or not, Pastor Russell believed that the Great Pyramid of Giza, that's the big one that stands in Egypt, in, in Cairo, or it's maybe not in Cairo, it's outside of Cairo, was built by the Hebrew people. He believed that the Hebrew people actually built the, the Great Pyramid of Giza, 
and that they built it underneath God's direction. And, they, and he believed that the uh, Great Pyramid of Giza was a symbol given by God through the Hebrew people for our generation. And he believed that it could, the dimensions of it and everything were only to be understood for our day. In fact, his, his dates, 1874 and 1914, were calculated by studying in depth the Great Pyramid of Giza. This is exactly how the dates were come to. Now this image of a pyramid, by the way, which uh, is, stands here obviously next to Pastor Russell's tomb, this is a nine-foot stone pyramid with a Masonic symbol engraved on its side, and it's a memorial to the Watchtower Society and a, a memorial to Pastor Russell. You will never see any Jehovah's Witness who is aware of this. This is not something that's public knowledge. I never knew this whenever I was going uh, to the Kingdom Hall and I was a Jehovah's Witness. These are some of the strange facts that you find out later once you get outside of that mind control cult that, uh, that people are in once they're in a, they're in a cult. Uh, you know, notice here it says, for some 35 years Pastor Russell thought that the Great Pyramid of Giza was God's stone witness corroborating biblical time periods. But Jehovah's Witnesses have abandoned the idea that an Egyptian pyramid had anything to do with true worship. Again, you see a flip-flop. They teach one thing, and then all of a sudden they change their tune. And this is very common in Jehovah's Witnesses uh, theology. Everybody still with me? I see that we have uh, several people joining us still. Great to have everybody here tonight. We're keeping going, talking about how to witness to Jehovah's Witnesses. We're laying the foundation first. And now we're going to move on to some quick facts about Jehovah's Witnesses. Let's talk about the staggering size of this quickly growing cult. Um, they've only been around since the early 1900s. We could go back to the late 1800s, but really they didn't really begin growing quickly until the early 1900s. Currently, uh, the Jehovah's Witness population is around 6.6 .6 million practicing members. That's still a small religion, so to speak, but it's a very fast growing religion. Nearly 100,000 congregations, Kingdom Halls, worldwide in over 230 countries. No collection is taken at these uh, congregations. When you walk in the door, there's never a collection taken. There's a little box that sits at the back, and uh, that is how they conduct their business. The Watchtower Society oversees the Kingdom Halls. It is, so to speak, the corporate headquarters, and it produces all of the literature for, for the Jehovah's Witnesses. It has produced literature in 432 languages. There are currently 6.2 million home Bible studies being conducted by Jehovah's Witnesses all around the world. And that is exactly what they want to do with you when they come out and knock at your door. When they knock at your door, they have literature, and their whole goal is to get you to sit down with them and talk about the Bible, and they want to engage you in a Bible study, and they want to take you through one of their books. Now, there's two magazines that the Jehovah's Witnesses bring with them when they go out to the door. First of all, there's the Watchtower. The Watchtower is the primary Bible study aid for the members of the faith. It has an average printing of $28 million, uh, per week, and it's published in 155 languages. The Awake magazine is a religious magazine with some general interest items. It's published in 81 languages, and it has an average printing of 34 million. The Awake is kind of a very... Uh, uh, it's kind of almost a secular magazine. It's, it's designed to draw you in. The Watchtower, instead, is actually the primary Bible study tool. When you go to a Jehovah's Witness congregation on Sunday morning, what you, will, you, what you will see is that they actually read from the Watchtower magazine. Now, the Bible, obviously, is, is used to back up the Watchtower, but they actually open up the magazine, and they take turns reading through a, an article. And that is actually how they get fed every single Sunday morning. They are fed by this Watchtower Bible and Tract Society headquartered uh, in New York, and they are uh, fed by these men. It is a very strange type of setup. Now, interesting enough, these two magazines have the largest circulation of any religious magazines in the world. They are a very fast-growing cult. Now, Let's talk about this Watchtower Bible and Tract Society for a minute. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that God is only using the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society organization to guide his people today. 
That's they believe. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that God has personally set up the Watchtower Society as his visible representative on earth. According to Jehovah's Witnesses, there, no one would be able to understand the Bible without the Watchtower Society's magazines and without its literature. Okay, So obviously, all Jehovah's Witnesses are expected to obey the Watchtower as the voice of God. So when the Watchtower magazine is distributed every week, that is the voice of God. It is not wrong. It's always right. So if we had the Watchtower magazine saying one thing and the United States federal government saying another thing, the Watchtower wins in the Jehovah's Witnesses' life. And this is seen in the many deaths that have occurred from blood transfusions and organ transplants uh, that are refused, uh, that have been refused at least in the past, by Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, I remember when I was a Jehovah's Witness, I was required to carry around a card at all times on me that said that I was refusing at all times to receive a blood transfusion because they take a, a verse out of Leviticus and they take it out of context and they say that you should not eat blood. And they also shows up in the book of, uh, of Acts. You should not eat blood. Well, obviously, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a transfusion, but the Watchtower decided that that verse meant that no one should have a, a blood transfusion or otherwise it would dishonor God. And because the Watchtower Society determined that, every Jehovah's Witness was required not to receive blood transfusions. Obviously, this has caused many deaths. Um, now, you can obviously see this absolute submission to the Watchtower Society every time you talk to a Jehovah's Witness. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses are not to think for themselves when it comes to biblical interpretation. That's why when you try to get them to interpret the Bible at the door, they're like zombies. They don't understand the freedom that you have in just picking up a Bible and just reading what it says. They don't have that same liberty. And you need to be sensitive to that. You don't need to torture them for that. You don't need to put them down for that. You've got to understand where they are. I'm going to show you how to reach them right where they are tonight. But Again, don't, don't tower over them and don't uh, demonstrate to them that, that you're obviously better than they are because they're a cult member. Feel compassion for them. Recognize, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but recognize that these people desperately want to know the truth. They've just stumbled into the wrong pit, and you're there to help them because you are God's uh, representative right there ready to help them. You are, you are Christ to that person. And so we'll talk more about strategies and tips and techniques on how you can do that tonight. This is a very responsible thing that you can do. And I pray that uh, you'll be taking notes on these things here in a few minutes. Obviously, also keep this in mind, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society has the ability to disfellowship those who will not conform to their views. And this fear of disfellowshipping and, and the pain that it causes is a strong deterrent against misbehavior and independent thinking. What happened to me was when I was about 16 or 17 years old, I asked too many questions. I couldn't get any answers. Nobody was answering my questions. I began to wonder what was going on. I just, I, I just simply stopped going to the, uh, um, to the Kingdom Hall, about 16 or 17 years old. What happened to me was I was disfellowshipped because I was not attending. And what disfellowshipping means is that anyone who sees me from that congregation or anyone who knows that I'm a Jehovah's Witness and they're a Jehovah's Witness, they're not to talk to me. I remember I was 16 or 17 years old. I would run into some of my friends from the Jehovah's Witness congregation, and they wouldn't say anything to me. I would try to talk to them, and they would walk away from me. They were instructed not to talk to Jerry because I had been disfellowshipped, and I was a danger uh, to their spirituality because I had left the flock, so to speak. This is obviously causes much pain when it happens to a family member. Imagine when one of your family members and Jehovah's Witnesses is disfellowshipped, you're told to be very cautious around that person. Um, so that's a very strong deterrent that the Watchtower has used. And I think you would be completely correct if you're sitting there right now asking yourself, you know, the Watchtower Society claims to be this true prophet, the only true prophet on the earth. Then you ask yourself, well, how did people understand the truth for the last 1,800 years without the, the Watchtower Society? Think about that. You know, Jehovah's Witness is standing at your door telling you that he has all the answers and that you cannot understand the Bible without his literature. Mormons do the same thing. Well, isn't that interesting that for 1,800 years, 1,900 years, 
men have been able to understand the Bible or come to Christ without this special knowledge. Again, we see that we're dealing with cults. Remember, Jehovah's Witnesses always carry literature when going to door to door, and the, they rest in the knowledge that they are trained and that they're able to take down the strongest skeptics at the door. Uh, I, I want to share a, a story with you uh, in a few minutes, but maybe I'll just tell it to you right now. I remember knocking on somebody's door when I was a Jehovah's Witness, and I'm knocking on obviously lots of doors, but I remember what, knocking on one in particular. He was a pastor, and I remember him so clearly because I, I ran into him two or three times after I had been saved, and uh, I remember his face even to this day. I knocked on the door. I was probably 15 years old. I knocked on his door. He answered and he was so hostile to me, I was actually scared. But I was so comfortable in my knowledge that I had, he wasn't able to take me down. Jehovah's Witnesses can make doctrinal pretzels out of most Christians at the door because most Christians do not know what they believe or why they believe it. And Jehovah's Witnesses are pounded every single week, day in and day out, on what they believe and why they believe it. And they're always ready to defend their faith. And so when they come to your door and they show you a Bible verse you've never seen before from their Bible, it can become very frustrating for you to defend it because you haven't been sitting around all day long trying to learn how to defend your Bible. Maybe you do, and, and good for you if you do. But even if you don't, I mean, who has time like, like the way these folks do? And they really do take it very, very seriously. And they are on a mission to convert Christians especially to see the light. But I remember knocking on this guy's door. And he was very hostile to me. And he was just on the verge of calling me names. He had a red face. And he was so upset that I could not see his viewpoint. And he further steeled me against Christians. I, I said, I, I walked away from that moment saying, he, he is possessed. He is possessed. He has a demon. And obviously, I was the one who was, you know, uh, hellbound. But honestly, for most Jehovah's Witnesses, that never works. They don't. They're not interested. I mean, when, when you actually begin to get frustrated with them or you begin to talk down to them, well, they're used to it. You know, the average Jehovah's Witness has the door slammed in their face. It's the very rare exception when somebody actually shows them love, shows them compassion, shows them tenderness, is very intellectually honest with them, and sits down with them, offers them to come in, offers them a cup of tea, talks to them very gently, doesn't talk down to them. That's unbelievably disarming to a Jehovah's Witness because the majority of people he's seeing either A, don't care, or B, want to bite his head off. And so if you don't fall into one of those two categories, you stick out. Okay, let's keep going. The divine name. This is another thing to keep in mind. The divine name, yad heh vav -Hey. That's That's Jehovah uh, what they've translated as Jehovah, and you've got to realize that they're using this word Jehovah. When a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door, they will point to the name Jehovah in their Bible, and they will appeal to the importance of using the divine name Jehovah. And they'll show you Jehovah in the King James Version. It says that in Psalms 83, 18. I have that memorized from back when I was a kid. And I would always show, because they would always say, why are, you, why are you praying to Jehovah? You should pray to Jesus. And I'd show them, the, well, look, at Psalms 83, 18, it says that Jehovah. And then they'll cause you to question, obviously, uh, you know, why you don't pray to Jehovah, because God says his name is Jehovah. Well, Jehovah, by the way, is a man-made term. If you notice here at the bottom of this slide, it says yad heh vav or Y-H-W-H, plus Adonai. You've heard Adonai, Lord, that's the Greek word for Lord. Um, what they do here is, uh, what has been done is the, uh, uh, the consonants, yeah, the... Uh, the vowels have been taken out of Adonai, the A, the O, and the A, and they have been inserted into yad heh vav -Hey. So you got a Y, and then you got the A from Adonai, and then you have the H, and then you have the O from Adonai that's inserted. And then, because so you remember, Hebrew doesn't have uh, 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 any uh, um, vowels. I'm getting confused here. I, I need an I need I need English language uh, lesson. Let's see here. But uh, anyway, so we have yad heh vav -Hey and Adonai. You put these two together, and here you have uh, Yahoah, or in the English, Jehovah. Now, 
if I misspoke on any of that, you can correct me later. But but basically, that's basically how how they come up with this name. Um, so that's the idea. Now, when confronted with this, here's here, here's the point. Your goal is to help the Jehovah's Witness realize that Jehovah God and Jesus Christ are the same. Jesus never refers to God as Jehovah, but only as the Father. But listen, here's the most important thing. Do not debate this with the Jehovah's Witness. You will lose this debate. Unless you have studied, studied this whole thing, you will be at, at a distinct disadvantage. And when they sense your ignorance, they'll dismiss you. It's so vital that you never you never get into that place where they're able to dismiss you. Stay with what you know. And I, I won't dwell on this. Uh, let's instead move on to uh, their warped view of, of Jesus. Let's take a look at their view of Jesus. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is a created God, and he's also known as Michael the Archangel. Now, that's a weird view. Jesus was the firstborn of all creation, according to, to the Watchtower. Okay, according to Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, now hang tight. Let's check this out. Jesus was the firstborn of all creation. Prior to his incarnation, he existed as Michael the Archangel in heaven. So Michael the Archangel became Jesus. Now, upon his, now I'm telling you the Jehovah's Witness view now. Upon his earthly birth, Michael the Archangel became named, his name became Jesus. And he was a perfect, sinless, good man. But he was only a man. He was not empowered as the Christ until his baptism. And here's another point that they say. They say Christ did not die on a cross, but rather upon an upright torture stake. Okay, this is why they don't allow people to wear crosses, and that's why a cross offends them. If you're wearing a cross and you're uh, answering the door to Jehovah's Witness, take it off. You say, well, why would I hide my faith? Look, it's more important to, to reach these people at their level. Become a Jew to the Jew, become a Greek to the Greek. They are very offended at the cross. They believe that it's a pagan symbol. So hide it because it's not worth uh, them causing, uh, them dismissing you based upon a cross. I mean, you can hide that and still talk to them. Now, upon his death, here's what they view. Upon his death, Christ was laid in a tomb and his body was disintegrated by God the Father. The Father then recreated Jesus' body three days later, and he had no physical body, only a spiritual one. Then this recreated Jesus then ascended back to the Father, where he once again became Michael the Archangel. And he will never, ever, ever, ever again be seen on the earth again visibly. Now, they also teach that he will execute judgment on the earth from heaven, and after the judgment he will never be seen by earth's new paradise inhabitants. He will only be seen by the select 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses who rule with him in heaven. Now, of course, this is all rubbish. In fact, the New Testament, uh, uh, we find the name most prominent is Jesus. Jesus is all over the place. Um, and, and this really leads us to ask the question, isn't Jesus God? And here's where I want to show you a few things. First of all, in John 1.1, 1, 1, you may be thinking, isn't it so clear? I mean, John 1.1 1, 1 tells you, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And obviously the Word the Word becomes, you know, Jesus. Obviously later on as we read, the context shows us that it's Christ. He is the Word of God, manifest in the flesh. So we look at that verse, and we may point this out to the Jehovah's Witness and say, look, can't you see that right here it says that Jesus is God? But we mustn't forget that they also have a Bible translation. And here's what theirs says. In the beginning, the Word was, and the Word was with God, and the Word was what? A, little g, God. So the New World Translation, that's what NWT stands for, is their version. Now, here's the other key. We're going to talk about their version in just a minute. Always use their version when they come to your door. Don't break out your King James. Normally, you would have to. I'm going to show you how to use their Bible to show them that they're wrong. There's still a few verses in that book, in their Bible, that still contradict themselves. They have revised this thing over and over again. I'm going to show you one tonight that you can use next time someone comes to your door. This particular passage is going to knock them off the, the patio. It's going to knock them off your porch. They, they probably have never even seen it before. 
but it's coming straight from the New World Translation. If you break it, if you break out a King James version on one of these Jehovah's Witnesses, they are instantly going to view you as demon possessed. They're instantly going to dismiss you, and they're going to they're going to move into it a a, a uh, very territorial and very argumentative state. They're going to view you as the enemy. You don't want to end up in that place. Let's talk about this New World Translation. The New World Translation is um, you know it's when you think about Jehovah's Witnesses they have a, just like I, did, I, just, I just discussed Christ with you about how they view Jesus Christ it's got to be very difficult teaching all this renegade theology without a Bible to back it all up so in 1950 the Jehovah's Witnesses published the New World Translation now they have been using by the way many Jehovah's Witnesses don't know this but they had been using the King James Version or the American Standard Version all the way up until 1950. But in 1950, they created their own Bible, they translated their own Bible, and their reason for it, they said, was um, because the language in the uh, King James Version was archaic. And what they produced was a grammatical nightmare for scholars. Um, Interesting, I'm just stopping here just to take a look at some of the uh, questions that are coming in and comments. Uh, D says, I have a friend dying as you speak because she needs blood. And I assume uh, D is referring to one of her uh, friends who is a Jehovah's Witness who is actually dying because she needs blood. I'm telling you folks, this is real. I mean, they literally will not take blood. Uh, because of their their theology and babies I, I know you hate to think about it I do too it breaks my heart but little babies have been in this in this situation wives and husbands car wrecks become normal normal uh, uh, normal occurrences maybe a, a profuse bleeding situation which could normally be contained can become deadly to a Jehovah's Witness because they don't accept blood transfusions um, Gilbert, our good friend Gilbert says, uh, uh, does does Kingdom do Kingdom Halls own a lot of other property? He says in today's New York paper, an article appeared titled "Brooklyn Holy Land." Brooklyn Kingdom Hall is seeking to relocate. The article states they own 30 meticulously kept buildings and three lots worth hundreds of millions of dollars in two affluent neighborhoods. Uh, Gilbert, uh, they they own they they do own a lot of property around the. The, the country and around the world, their buildings are very meager uh, or very uh, Spartan, I guess would be the right word. And the fact that they actually build these things in three days. Uh, they are always very proud of, about, about how they can construct a kingdom hall in a very short amount of time. Um, they bring a lot of volunteers in. and they So their buildings are really just kind of, you know, they're Spartan. There's not much to them. They're, they're kind of prefab. But the land that they sit on, yeah, that's probably worth a lot of money. Interesting, interesting comments and questions. Feel free to chime in with those. I'm keeping my eye on those over there. The New World Translation has been condemned as an incredibly heretical and gross translation of the Greek language and the Hebrew language. Now notice what this says in the second box here. This is staggering. Now you don't want to break out this information on a Jehovah's Witness the first day you meet them because they'll think that you're lying. They'll think that you're just basically trying to uh, argue with them because they're not going to believe anything negative about the world, uh, about the uh, Watchtower Society. They don't have anything negative to say about the Watchtower Society. They'll believe that if you're attacking it, you're basically attacking God. So you don't necessarily want to go there on your very first discussion. But these are things to keep in your back pocket. The translators for the New World Translation were kept private in the name of humility because they didn't want to honor themselves before men, because they had produced such an immensely powerful and amazing Bible translation. They, they decided to stay humble and not name their names. Well, when the members of the translation committee were finally made known, it was highly embarrassing. Five members translated the Bible, and all of them had no biblical Hebrew or biblical Greek training. None of them. And this is why... The New World Translation 
is an absolute horrendous mess. It's a train wreck. And that we're going to show you some scriptures here in just a minute that show you. Uh, but this is the Bible that Jehovah's Witnesses insist on using at your door. So you're going to have to get creative, and you're going to need to, you, you're going to actually have to use their Bible. Because if you use their Bible, you won't believe the kind of respect you'll get. You can break out your King James, but you've got to realize they're not going to listen to it. If you can get on their ground and show them from their own territory, in their own town, if you can get right there where they are, and you can show them where they're wrong without being rude, without being hateful or hostile, but just lovingly show them from their own book. They can't fight you if it's their own book. Well, this is the Bible they're going to insist on using at, the, at your door, so you're going to have to get creative. But this is the story about the New World Translation. Now, let me, let me show you how this, how this works here. It says here in Isaiah 43, 10, and 11, Are we witnesses of Jehovah or Jesus? Here's what it says. You are my witnesses, is the utterance of Jehovah, even my servant whom I have chosen in order that you may know and have faith in me, and that you may understand that I am the same one. Before me there was no God formed, and after me there continued to be none. I am God. I am Jehovah, and besides me there is no Savior. Okay, that's what it says in Isaiah 43, 10, and 11, in the New World Translation. Acts 1, 8, it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, Jesus is talking, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Obviously this is kind of strange, because are we witnesses of Jehovah? as Jehovah's Witnesses say, because here it says Jehovah says you are my witnesses. But in Acts 1, it says that Jesus says you're my witnesses. So are we witnesses to Jehovah, or are we witnesses to Jesus? Well, perhaps we can be witnesses of both, as the Jehovah's Witnesses would say, or perhaps Jehovah and Jesus are the same person. Let's ask this question, who is I am? Exodus 3.14, here's what the Bible says. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So God proclaims his name as I am. Now in John 8.58, in the King James Version, it says, Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you before Abraham was, I am. And the Bible tells us that the, the Pharisees picked up stones to kill him because he had declared himself to be equal with God. Why is that? Because he used the same name that God used for himself. I am. Now, you may think, well, just show this to the Jehovah's Witness in his own Bible, and he'll see that he's wrong. Well, if you take a look at his Bible, what it says in John 8:58 is that most assuredly I say to you before Abraham was, I have been. And so you run into a problem there, and that they keep changing their Bible translation so it fits their theology. Who is the Savior? Isaiah 43:11 says, I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. Here we see who is the Savior. Titus 2.13, it says, Looking for the great and blessed hope uh, and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You may think, well, just point this out. The Bible says there is no Savior but, uh, but uh, a God, and here the, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is a Savior. Well, the problem is, is when we read the New World Translation. It says, while we wait for the happy, hope, and glorious manifestation of the great God and of the Savior of us, Christ Jesus. So, obviously, in the New King James, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, is a decorative sentence that, makes, that equates Jesus Christ with being our God and Savior, whereas their scripture basically uh, brings Christ Jesus down to something not being uh, the great God, and not being our Savior. Uh, so it's a very, very difficult thing when you're dealing with the New World Translation. What about salvation? Well, salvation uh, is something we always need to look at when we're dealing with a false cult. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that a person must be part of their religious organization in order to be saved and to have eternal life. It's all works with no assurance of salvation. It's all up to Jehovah whether you're going to survive based upon your good deeds. Obviously, this gives us no real assurance. I remember when I was a Jehovah's Witness, I never really had any assurance that I was going to uh, 
you know, be uh, pleasing to Jehovah. That's why I did so many works. That's why I pounded on doors every Saturday. That's why I tried to be good to my neighbor. And that's why Jehovah's Witnesses really and truly are very kind, good people. I mean, they are motivated to be very good people because they desire to please Jehovah. Right? Jehovah is the ultimate judge here, and their works are what's going to determine whether or not they are going to be saved in the end. Christians, true Christians, true believers, have a hope that they will be saved based upon the good grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his finished work at the cross, our faith being in that, but not of works. But Jehovah's Witnesses obviously teach a works-based salvation. And a couple of comments here about blood transfusions and organ transplants to, to finish this off. Organ transplants were banned in 1967 as the equivalent of cannibalism. Then, in 1980, the Watchtower Society gained what they call new light, that is, they were enlightened by uh, the heavens, and they legitimized uh, organ transplants no longer being equated with cannibalism in 1980, and they began to allow it. And so the question arises, how many people died from 1967 to 1980 because the Watchtower Society did not have that new light? Why did all those people die in vain? It's, it's simply tragic. Vaccinations. They were banned in 1931. They were, they, it was said by the Watchtower Society that they were a direct violation of the everlasting covenant that God had made with Noah. Then, in the 1950s, they suddenly le legitimized vaccinations. How many children died because they were not vaccinated against diseases that were completely preventable? Because the Watchtower Society gained new light. Obviously, it's something to think about. Well, let's take a real brief break here. And just uh, for our minds, because we've just ingested a whole lot, we're kind of uh, moving into the uh, final swing here as we move into the tips and techniques on how to reach a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, well, let's take a look at some famous Jehovah's Witnesses. Dwight D. Eisenhower, did you know that? He was a Jehovah's Witness. He was raised a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, Venus Williams, Serena Williams. You can look at the list here. Prince, Selena. Remember the Selena singer who was killed tragically? George Benson. Uh, Larry Graham, who was part of the Sly and the Family Stone. Michael Jackson, Janet, all the Jackson Five were Jehovah's Witnesses. Jerry Hallowell, she's a singer with the Spice Girls. Patti Smith, um, Ja Rule, all the Wayans brothers, Naomi Campbell, the supermodel, Jehovah's Witness. Did you know that? Mickey Spillane, best-selling crime novelist. He was a convert to Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, this list is obviously very short. It's all I could fit on this one page, but there is a lot of famous Jehovah's Witnesses. You wouldn't believe how many there are. Um well-known Jehovah's Witnesses. Let me stop and take a look at the question box before we continue. Still have a really healthy crowd. Great to have everybody here tonight. Let me go over here and see uh, if we have any questions or comments. Um, Lynn says, please slow down a, just a tidbit. So interesting. Trying to write furiously. Thanks. Hey, Lynn, I'm sorry about that. I know we have to cover so much. These webinars, by the way, are available to all of our 300 club partners. 300 club partners are those who, have st who are standing with us with a gift of $25 a month. and They get access to all these webinars uh, for as long as they want. And if you want to become a part of that, you simply call our uh, hotline operators are standing by. Chris, by the way, is standing by on, on the phone at 918-827-5764. Say, hey, I want to get a copy of this for later, and she'll tell you exactly how to do that. Um, <laughs> Gilbert says, Jerry, thank you for tonight for very informative, uh, good information. Any short books by former Jehovah's Witness you would recommend? Yeah, there's one by a fellow by the name, and I hope I don't say this wrong. I think it's Frederick Franz. I can't remember. That, or Raymond Franz. It, his last name is Franz. One of the best books on Jehovah's Witnesses. Really, really good. Um, and... Uh, and let me think about this. Also, Ron Rhodes wrote a book. Ron Rhodes, R-H-O-D-E-S. And his book literally was called Witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, or no, reason, no, no, no. It was called Reasoning from the Scriptures with Jehovah's Witnesses. Man, I tell you, that was one of the best books. And he was not a Jehovah's Witness. But I tell you what, he was the best read 
that I had ever seen. He was very careful um, in his investigation of Jehovah's Witnesses and was very thoughtful and very honest and uh, didn't come across like you know better than everybody else um, in his writing. Ron Rhodes, I really like that book, Reasoning from the Scriptures with Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, D says, how can they receive an organ transplant without getting some blood from the donor? Eh, that's a good point, D. Uh, they are allowed to take plasma uh, and some sort of, I can't remember the details, but I was allowed to, d to do some sort of plasma transplant, or no, a plasma donation, like a, a transfusion, but I wasn't allowed to take real blood. Um, David says, how do they respond to the verse in the Bible that deals with works? Uh, David, they, they really do. They just kind of weasel themselves around it in their translation. And, uh, they point out the fact that Jehovah is pleased by our good deeds and that we are to continue to do work for the kingdom and, uh, and, uh, to please Jehovah through our, through our, uh, good deeds. It's, uh, it's really sad. There's no confirmation of their salvation. They're constantly in a state of trying to please the Lord. D says, the book is called, the one I was trying to tell you before, his name is Raymond Franz. Thank you, D. Very good. The name is called Crisis of Conscience. Crisis of Conscience. One of the best books on Jehovah's Witnesses I think you'll ever read. Very good read. And uh, read it and give it to a friend, um, and uh, I think that you'll see good fruit from that uh, as well. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's dive right back in. I don't want to keep you here all night. We're going to try to get things wrapped up here in the next 20, 25 minutes, so we'll get everything in. Um, again, i, I got to tell you, I really, really enjoy this community that we have here with these webinars. I, I really do. Uh, I wish you knew how much I really appreciate all of you that come in here every single month and uh, spend time with us on these webinars. It is such a joy to to talk about these things to people all around the world all at one time. This is amazing technology. And I want you to know that our ministry uh, just simply loves you. We care about you. Uh, that's why we do what we do here at our ministry. We are, we are here to educate, equip, and empower you. I mean, that's as simple as it gets. That's what we want to do. We want to see you grow in your knowledge of the things that are important. That way, that knowledge can be turned into wisdom. And that wisdom can be made to make God look great in the end. So anyway, let's uh, keep moving on. Tips for witnessing to the Jehovah's Witness at your door. Let's get down to the nitty-gritty. What do you need to know now that I've kind of given you a brief 101 on what Jehovah's Witnesses are kind of thinking when they walk up to your door? Let's talk about now what can you do to actually help the Jehovah's Witness see the error of their ways. Well, first of all, let's ask the question, why is the Jehovah's Witness at your door? Well, the reason that the Jehovah's Witness is pounding on your door at 9 o'clock in the morning on Saturday is because he's been trained to go. They really do take the Great Commission seriously there in the Kingdom Hall. They have been trained to go and tell of Jehovah's Kingdom. And they want to interest you in having a Bible study, and then they eventually want to convert you. That's their whole goal. They simply take the Bible literally, at least in that particular instance, and say they're just simply going to go. I remember that in Jehovah's Witnesses, the, the, the most respected people were those that they call pioneers. And those are the people who dedicated their whole life to spreading the kingdom of Jehovah through knocking on doors. I tell you what, in Jehovah's Witnesses, rising through the ranks and becoming a full-time, what they call pioneer, was simply the most amazing honor that anyone could have. You spent your whole life, and you know these full-time pioneers were pretty much guaranteed they were going to be in the good graces of God because they were working so hard. And that's really what this was all about. It was all about work. But they've been trained to go and knock on your door, and their whole goal is to get a little bit of flicker of interest in you. They just want to find some interest in you. And if they find that interest and they want to invite you to have a home Bible study right there in your home. They will literally, I remember I was conducting Bible studies in several people's homes. I would simply go to their home and take my Bible, the New World Translation, and a copy of one of the Watchtower's books. And we would go through and we would read these together. And 
you know, it was a very loving approach. I mean, it was very biblical in the way we were trying to die to, to disciple people. And then after you uh, do the Bible study with them, then you bring them to the kingdom hall, you introduce them there. And then eventually they end up knocking on doors as well. Jehovah's Witnesses have a high conversion rate. People say, well, knocking on doors doesn't work. If you look, and I don't, I didn't have time to get one. If you look at a growth chart of Jehovah's Witnesses, you tell me that knocking on doors does not work. Unbelievable conversion rate. Well, you say, well, it doesn't work for us. Well, it works for them. They re it really works for them well. Knocking on doors. I believe that the devil, one of the devil's greatest lies that he ever told the Christian community was that knocking on doors doesn't work. I'm telling you, you look at the growth charts, it's, it's off the charts. They're growing quickly because they are going to people, their homes. They're not, one thing going for the Jehovah's Witnesses, obviously they're, they're, they're false, obviously they have bad theology, but you know, with every single lie, there's a little bit of truth. And one thing about the Jehovah's Witnesses, they are being faithful in evangelism. you got to give them that. You have to give them that. They aren't sitting in their churches, or they wouldn't dare call it churches. They're not sitting in their kingdom halls with Starbucks coffee and multimedia presentations and thousands of dollars worth of equipment and saying, come and experience this. They're actually going out to the door. They're knocking on the door, finding, finding the person who's broken, finding those people who are thinking about putting a gun to their head, finding those people who just lost their husband or their wife, finding those people who are desperate and are just and concerned about the future and all this. And they're walking up and knocking on the door and saying, hey, we have a solution. We have an answer. Do you want it? Now, you may disagree with their approach, but I got to tell you, you can't agree with the results of the approach. You can't disagree with the, the results of the approach. They're certainly growing fast. And so I think there are some ways in which we can take some cues from the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons even, because they, they are certainly taking the Great Commission very seriously, even though they're tremendously in error with their theology. They're teaching the wrong thing and sending people to hell. But my goodness, they are certainly going. And that is why the Jehovah's Witness is at your door. Now, why does the Jehovah's Witness seem so confident? You know, this is one thing that you kind of notice when they come up. They get pretty bold. Knock, somebody walks up on your door and starts knocking and then starts telling you what they think about the Bible. That's pretty darn bold. See, Jehovah's Witnesses see themselves as missionaries. They really do view this kingdom message as very important, and they view themselves as the sole holders of God's truth. They view themselves as the instruments and protectors of Jehovah's glory. And they're confident because they are very well trained in their doctrine. Every single Wednesday, at every single kingdom hall all over the world, there's something called the Theocratic Ministry School. And every single person in that room is encouraged to become a part of it. And what they do is they take turns giving uh, lectures or talks. They take turns in one-on-one -on -one scenarios. Is what, what would happen if you went to the door and somebody said this? What would you say if they said this? They teach these people how to witness. They're confident because, you know, somebody asked me one time because they, they see me get up and speak all, the, all over the place. They say, don't you ever get, don't you ever get uh, nervous getting up and speaking in front of all these different people? I was at a church not too long ago that had about three or 4,000 people at it. And somebody said, aren't you nervous? No. Why? Well, because I know my material. But I tell you what, you tell me to get up and start talking about, you know, uh, uh, the game of cricket or, you know, uh, or, or the rules of, uh, of pool, you know, uh, the game pool. I, I, you know, there's some things I don't know. There's a lot of things I don't know. And I would be very nervous talking about those things in front of a group. But if it's something that I know, I'm very confident. And you're the same way. Whatever you know very well, you're not, you don't get uh, 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 nervous talking about it. And that's why they're confident at the door, because they know their doctrine. They know it. And that's why they're confident. Okay? So that's why they seem confident at the door. Now, let's talk about how you can impact the Jehovah's Witness at your door for Christ. Here's one thing to keep in mind. Let's talk about the attitude and some of the nonverbal stuff here. Remember, these Jehovah's Witnesses are trained for the most common comebacks. They see you coming a mile away. 
you may think you got a zinger on them. You may think, oh, I'm going to say this, and they're going to be amazed at, at this. They have heard it a jillion times. You know that old phrase, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. One of the most amazing things you can do for a Jehovah's Witness is appear to be loving. And not even just appear to be, be loving. A hateful and arrogant attitude is not going to go anywhere. And it's not even biblical. Remember that these Jehovah's Witnesses, they live and breathe this doctrine. And unless you're dealing with one of their brand new newbies, you're not going to catch them off guard without doing some good research. It just simply is not going to happen. Um, let's say these. A hateful or arrogant attitude is not going to go anywhere. Get you nowhere. A know-it-all attitude will not help you. I can't, I can't even tell you how many know-it-alls I saw at the door. Now, you, we have to ask, you know, is the Jehovah's Witness a know-it-all? I mean, I guess perhaps you could say that, but we're not supposed to return that as, as believers. If you're a know-it-all, or you're basically condescending to them, it's not going to help. Preaching at them, oh my goodness gracious, I can't tell you how many people preached at me at the door. That didn't help. Telling them that they're wrong is not going to help. And I tell you one of the worst things you can do is break out your King James Version Bible and tell them that you're born-again Christian. It's not going to help. You know why? Because they believe that you're demon-possessed if you're born again. They don't understand it. So if you want a chance to witness to a cult member, you have to treat them like a human being. Remember, they're human, and they're searching for God. They're hungry. They're searching for God more you know, than your unsaved co-worker who never goes to church. You see these unsaved people? who go to the bars or the casinos or whatever they do for fun. I mean, who knows? You know, whatever. These Jehovah's Witnesses aren't sitting in a bar. They're, they're knocking on your door, and they're just as lost as the guy in the bar, but they're really searching for God. They just don't have a proper knowledge of it. And statistically, their chances of coming to Christ are very slim because they are in an absolute maze. They're in a place that is very difficult to get out of. They are in a mind-controlling cult. And when they knock on your door, God, think about this. When a, Jehovah's Witness is not, when a Jehovah's Witness knocks on your door, I'm talking to you. You're, you're listening to me. You hear me. I'm coming right at your computer speakers. I'm not talking to the whole group. I'm talking to you right there, right where you're sitting. When a Jehovah's Witness knocks on your door, God is giving them an opportunity to hear the truth. That is a powerful position to be in. Very powerful. Let's give a few more tips here. First of all, Jehovah's Witnesses always come in pairs. Always try to focus on the younger one. The older one, obviously, is going to be a lot more tough, to, tougher nut to crack. But focus on the younger Jehovah's Witness, if you can. Repeat yourself as often as necessary. Sometimes you're going to feel like you're repeating yourself or being a broken record. That's all right. Just repeat yourself as often as necessary. Know how to prove from your Bible that Jesus is God. That's vital. That's so vital. You should know that anyway. I mean, all of us should know, and I'm talking to myself too. We all should, should spend more time knowing what we believe and why we believe it. But especially when dealing with a witness, you need to know how to prove from your own Bible that Jesus is God. But remember, you're not going to be using your Bible initially. Your very first few steps with them are going to be using their Bible. Uh, you're going to love them. It's the most biblical thing we can do. They are so used to rudeness that love is like a refreshing cold cup of water. And this is the most important thing. In your love for them and in your compassion and mercy for them, don't let them change the subject. They are masters at this. I remember when I was at the door and somebody would try to hone me in on something and hem me in, I would quickly change the subject. And I would take it somewhere else because that's what they're trained to do. Change the subject. Don't let them pin you down. It's a very, um, it's a very intellectual game almost that they play. 
And so you have to be very careful. Do not let them change the subject. Okay, now let's get down to the nitty-gritty. What should you say to the Jehovah's Witness at the door? Let me check our question box here and see how we're doing. Uh, Chris has a comment. It's important to deal with Jehovah's Witnesses with compassion. When Christ was moved to compassion, miracles happened. Good point. Good point. Yeah, compassion is key. That love and compassion. Good, good point, Chris. Okay, what should you say to the Jehovah's Witness at the door? Okay, now remember, they are in a cult. They have been brainwashed. If you immediately tell them that you're a Christian, they're immediately going to shut you down in their mind. Your goal is to gently ask them questions that make them think. That's it. If I could sum it all up in one sentence, your goal is to gently ask them questions that make them think. Think about this, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23 through 26. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23 through 26 says this, But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition. You notice that word humility. If God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Boy, that speaks right to this situation. We have to be very gentle, not quarreling, able to teach, patient, and humility, correcting those who are in opposition to God. In all of my time as a Jehovah's Witness going door to door, I never encountered anyone who lovingly, gently, carefully, and patiently dealt with me in humility. I can say that for a certainty. I remember. It was always extreme. A, they didn't care. B, they wanted to bite my head off. And, or, they wanted, or, they, or they were very sarcastically debating me. They would, they would act like they loved me. They would act like they cared. But basically they were out to prove their point and they had an agenda. Okay? Obviously you have an agenda and you have a, po a point to prove. But you can always tell when somebody's being a little insincere when they just want to be right. Let me talk about two different strategies tonight. Number one strategy, and this is what we're going to close with. Number one strategy on how or what you should say to the Jehovah's Witness at the door. And that is what one of the uh, great apologists and uh, evangelists of our time, Ray Comfort, has told me. He says, what must I do to enter Jehovah's kingdom? And, here, and here's, what he, here's what he does in his illustration. He says, imagine that whenever a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door, put them in this situation. Just simply say this. Here's what Ray says. I have a knife in my back right now. Okay? He says he, he tries to get the Jehovah's Witness to understand this. I have a knife in my back right now. I will bleed to death in three minutes. What must I do to enter Jehovah's kingdom? And obviously the Jehovah's Witness is going to say, well, you know, that's obviously not what they were preparing for. They wanted to talk about the Watchtower magazine. So they'll try to answer your question, entertain you, and they'll say, well, there are many things. But then ask them when they say there are many things, what the thief on the cross had to do to enter paradise with Christ. It's powerful. It is something that makes them stop and think. What must I do to enter Jehovah's kingdom? Do you see the Jehovah's Witnesses? They don't have a way to enter Jehovah's kingdom except for lots and lots and lots of works. So the only way that a Jehovah's Witness could ever hope to get to heaven is through many works. And so and when they come to your door, ask them, what must I do to enter Jehovah's kingdom? Imagine that I have a knife in my back. I'm going to bleed to death in three minutes. What must I do? And they will tell you very, very quickly that they don't really know what you can do except come to the Kingdom Hall and read more books and study and do lots of works. And then when they, when they tell you all that, say, well, what did the thief on the cross have to do? He had to do nothing, didn't he? Now, you want to be very careful with that. You don't want to be a know-it-all when you say it. But it's something that you can do to prove a point to someone. It really would make them, I never heard that in all of my time going door to door. That would have been a very good thing to say to me. Because I would have walked away 
thinking about that. Because if, if the thing doesn't have an answer, it doesn't have an answer. If I can't do anything to enter Jehovah's kingdom right now in the next three minutes, then that's rough. How did the thief on the cross, how was he able to do it? So strategy number one is for those of you who are very type A personality, okay? You know who you are. Okay, how about strategy number two? This strategy right here is show who Jesus is. This strategy would have stopped me, and it's hard to say in retrospect, obviously. Who knows? But I can tell you, after I read this strategy, I would have, it would, this would have stopped me in my tracks at the door. And I have used this several times very, very effectively. And in this scenario, I never open a King James Bible. I never mention that I'm a Christian. I never wear a cross. I never tell them I'm born again. I never say any of that. I just lovingly and gently ask them questions. Now, you have to understand, before we talk about this, that a Jehovah's Witness who confesses that Jesus Christ is God Almighty has turned his back on the Kingdom Hall and he becomes excommunicated from their assembly. Everything is at stake. To you, you're just trying to, to prove a point. To him, he loses his family. To you, you're just trying to be right. To him, he won't see his friends anymore. To you, you get to tell somebody, hey, I want somebody for Christ. To, to them, it costs them everything. And so be very merciful when dealing with these people. So much is at stake for you to be right. And of course, we want to show them the truth, but goodness gracious, remember what's at stake for these people. They've staked everything on their belief, just as you have. So strategy number two, I found the easiest and most effective way to prove that Jesus is Almighty God to a Jehovah's Witness is from their own Bible. It's to use the Jehovah's Witnesses most quoted book, Revelation. They turn to Revelation over and over and over again. And here is the strategy. Let's go through this real quickly. And well, maybe not real quickly. We'll just run through this real, real, real briefly though. First of all, and here's the strategy, so take notes. This is what you want to do. I mean, I'm, tell, I'm giving you a play-by-play -play action here. When somebody walks up to your door, here's what you do. You don't break out your Bible. Grab theirs. After they tell you what they're all about, say, you mind if I see your Bible for a minute? No problem. You get their Bible, and you open it up to the book of Revelation. Okay? Okay, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the question box here, just checking things. We've got a few more things to confront here in a minute. Okay, Revelation 1.8. Let's read this together. This is, I am the Alpha. This, By the way, this is the Jehovah's Witness Bible. You ask the witness to read this. Get them to read it with their own mouth. It's very important that they read this. They need to be engaged. Have them read it, and they'll say, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says Jehovah God the one who is and who was and who is coming, the Almighty. After you, you have him read this, ask the, ask the witness, who is the Alpha and the Omega? And his response will be, it says right there in black and white, Jehovah God. And of course, if they say that this is Jesus, you're done, because the verse says this is the Lord God. He's the Almighty, right? So if they tell you this is Jesus, well, then your, your whole case is over. They're, they're basically going to be born again. They're not. They're going to say it's Jehovah God. All right, then, after you take them to this verse, then you ask them to read Revelation 21, verses 6 and 7. Let me go there. Okay. Revelation, verses 21, verses 6 and 7. Ask the witness to read this. And he said to me, They, they have come to pass. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To anyone thirsting, I will give from the fountain of the water of life free. Anyone conquering will inherit these things. I shall be his God and he will be my son. Now, after he reads that, ask the witness, who is the beginning 
and the end, the alpha and the omega. Okay, well, we already learned a while ago that the alpha and the omega was Jehovah God. So the same person is speaking, and he says, I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Well, the response must be Jehovah God. So Jehovah God here, again, Revelation 21, verses 6, 6, and 7. Okay, another verse, Revelation 22, 12, and 13. You may be thinking, well, how am I going to get to read all these four scriptures? Believe me, they never go away. These people want to talk to you about the Bible. And if you're reading from their Bible, I promise you they're going to sit there and read their own Bible. They're not scared of their Bible. They think that their Bible is perfect. So they'll be glad to read their Bible to you. Okay? Now, Revelation 22, verses 12 and 13. Here's where it gets interesting. In this verse, here's what we read. It says, look, I am coming quickly. And you have the witness read this. And the reward I give is with me to render to each one of his work as his work is, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Okay? Now, one thing that you can notice in this particular passage, if you thumb down to verse 16, you'll see that the verse opens up in verse 16 by saying, I, Jesus. But the witness, it may say that in verse 16 the speaker changes. Okay? And that's all right. That's fine. Just ask the witness who the first and the last is. Ask him, who is the first and the last? the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. And they're going to tell you it's Jehovah God, right? Because it all makes sense. It's all lined up. It's all contextual. Okay, well then, finally, turn the witness back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, and have him read this. And here's what it says. And when I saw him, I fell as dead at his feet, and he laid his right hand upon me and said, Do not be fearful. I am the first and the last, and the living one. And I became dead, but look, I am living forever and ever. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Now, after the witness reads this verse, you ask him a question. Your question is very simple. When did Jehovah God die? Because when we look at this scripture, that we just read, it says, do not be fearful, I am the first and the last. He has already told you that the first and the last is Jehovah God and the living one. I became dead. Okay, the speaker does not change. Their own Bible tells you that Jehovah God became dead. Now, Jehovah God, according to Jehovah's Witness theology, has never died. Only Jesus died. This is an absolute mistranslation in their Bible and they still have not corrected it. In their own Bible, Revelation 17 and 18, it proclaims that Jesus is Jehovah. It tells you in black and white. This is a, this is a powerful scripture to them. This will rock their world if you do this properly. When they read this, what you will discover, after they read 17 and 18, you're going to see them wringing their hands because they are going to, if they're intellectually honest, which all of them tend to, tend to at least try to be intellectually honest, even though many of them are not, they're going to try to see this, and they will not have anything to say. This is a very, very important scripture to show them. Now, after you show this, again, you ask the question, when did Jehovah God die? And they will be speechless. I've done this about seven or eight times every single time. The, the, the very first time I did it, the the the, uh, the the there was two of them, and the I was obviously talking to the younger one. The older one stepped in and changed the subject, and I said, "Look, let's go back to the subject at hand. I'll be happy to answer any other question, but I just need to know: Do you guys teach that Jehovah God died? Because it says right here that he he died. You don't understand how powerful this is, and what happens is it shakes them to their very core. Because if you read this out of the King James, they can dismiss it as a demonic version." But if they read it out of their own Bible, it's stunning. It, it, it stings. And they have no answer. And Jehovah's Witnesses have an answer for everything. They're trained to have an answer for everything. And when you give this to them, they will not know what to do. Now, the New World Translation, I've read a couple of news stories off of their website about a new world translation translation coming up 
and I promise you they're going to change this particular verse because this verse is explosive. So before they do, this is a tactic and a technique that can be used to help Jehovah's Witnesses see the error of their ways. Now, if you can get them to admit that there is at least something fishy about this, then you can ask for a follow-up meeting. And at your follow-up meeting, what you can do is you can begin to show them some of the things that we've talked about. But you don't want to show them all this up front. Remember, don't blow them away with all this information because they're going to not listen. They're going to tune you out. But if you'll show them this from their own Bible, don't be... Don't be talking about Jesus. Don't be talking about how he saved you and born again. You re those are all key words that they think you're demon-possessed. Don't be breaking out your King James. Stick with them. Stay with them. Like you're dealing with a, like, act as if you're dealing with a, a, a critical uh, patient who is about to die. Be loving. Be careful. Be compassionate. Be merciful. Act as if their whole soul depends upon them understanding this. And don't focus on yourself. Don't talk about what you did, what you have, what you've done. Focus on them. Merciful, compassion. And help them see that their own Bible convicts them of sin. Their own Bible convinces them that Jesus Christ is Jehovah God. That they are one and the same. The triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All three distinct persons, yet three in one able to save their souls and give them eternal life through the shed blood of Christ, the finished work of the cross, it's vital that they see this. And you can be used as an instrument to help them see this and bring them to salvation. So with all that said, we're really at 845, so we're really kind of uh, out of time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go look here in our question box and see what we have. I hope that you got some good information out of all this tonight. Let me see what... Uh, let me see what uh, questions we have. And uh, I, have a, I have a very exciting announcement I want to make here in just a couple of seconds. Let me check these uh, questions real quickly. With 6.6 .6 million members, it seems they would be discouraged to know about the 144,000 will make it to heaven. Do they consider this? D, it was really interesting when I was in Jehovah's Witnesses because they, I, I was always curious how they knew who these 144,000 were and they simply said that these individuals just simply knew. It was like a knowing that they had. And I remember at our Kingdom Hall, there was one really old guy. He was probably in his 90s. And he was, a, he was professing to be one of the 144,000. And everybody just really thought that he was the coolest thing since sliced bread. You know, they thought he was really neat. Um, but he said that he had a knowing, that he was one of the 144,000. And the other members who aren't part of that, they, they just simply consider themselves just lucky to know the truth. Um, so that really wasn't a, an issue that I noticed. Uh, Sharon, uh, Dee and Sharon, by the way, both the three club partners, uh, great to have you tonight. Sharon says, I think our tendency to be defensive is because we do not know what we believe as well as the JWs do. Sharon, that's a very uh, important and revealing comment. I really have to agree with you. Most of us don't, we have to admit, most of us aren't sitting around once a week uh, sharpening our skills to defend our faith, as these Jehovah's Witnesses do. Even though, they're, even though they're sharpening their skills with wrong theology, nevertheless, they're doing it. And so I think you're right. Sometimes we do come across defensive. And, um, you know, we just do our best. Uh, but I think that we can all learn something from this tonight. Uh, Chris asks the question D. She's asking a question to D. D. What is your friend's first name who is refusing a blood transfusion so that we may pray for her? Very good. Dee, if, uh, if you can send us the first name, well, we want to put her on the prayer list so we can pray that God, that God would open her eyes to see the uh, truth. Her name is uh, Verla. Is that V-E-R-L-A? Verla. Um, so anyway, Chris, that's the name. And any of you want? Yeah, she says, yeah, that's right, Verla. Anyone wants to pray for Verla tonight, please do. Lift her up in your prayers tonight. Someone who is dying for refusing a blood transfusion because she believes in what the Bible uh, is taught in uh, Jehovah's Witness theology, that it's wrong to accept a blood transfusion. Oh, it's unbelievable. It's sad. So pray and lift up Verla tonight. Let me uh, make an announcement real quickly as we move out. To, and for the person who doesn't know Christ, 
they're doomed to a Christless eternity. And nothing can be more severe than that. Nothing can be more uh, harmful than that. And I'll tell you what, I want to conclude uh, tonight um, with a time of, uh, of prayer and repentance. Um, and I want to just basically give the, uh, the gospel message to anyone who is listening. Perhaps we had a Jehovah's Witness stumble in tonight, unknowingly, uh, and wanted to know more about this. Perhaps we have someone in the audience who is not born again. Maybe someone who has never accepted Christ. They hear us talking about this gospel. They hear us talking about this faith. They hear us talking about this, this hope that we have. Well, what is that hope? Well, in essence, the hope is that God the Father created man in his own image. We are made in the image of God. And through sin, the original sin, we inherited corruption from Adam. Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the garden. They chose to eat the fruit from the tree. They chose to follow the voice of the enemy, the serpent. And in so doing, the image of God was distorted in man. Sin entered in to mankind. And through one man's sin, all were made corrupt. All were basically inheriting death. And so the second Adam had to come, and that was Jesus Christ. God in the flesh, come down from heaven, left the glories of heaven for the depths of the earth, and through his birth, life, death, burial, and resurrection, Christ demonstrated for us what the image of God truly was. When Christ walked the earth, he was showing us what it meant to be in the image of God. We didn't know because we were distorted. We were distorted by sin. But Christ was not distorted by that sin. He was not distorted at all. He was a perfect picture of what man was supposed to be. He was a perfect picture of a man who loved and sought and prayed and longed after God. He was our example. He was the second Adam. He was in the image of God. And we become transformed through the renewing of our minds through the process of sanctification to become like that, but we can never do it without God's help. In fact, it takes God to do the whole thing. Until we're, until we're actually born again, we can do nothing. And so the way we become born again is that we recognize that we have sin. We recognize that we are a distorted image of the true image of God and that we need a Savior. We need the Savior, and that Savior came in the form of a man named Jesus Christ who bore all of our sin and took it upon himself and hung on the cross, endured all the persecution, endured the humiliation, and instead took all that on for, him, for, for, uh, for us. And now when we place our faith, hope, and trust in that resurrected Christ, when we believe that God raised Christ from the dead, we become born again. We turn from death to life. We turn from sin to righteousness. And we are declared righteous by our belief in and our faith in Jesus Christ. And that is what is known in the Bible as something called regeneration. Our spirits are regenerated. We become a new being. We become a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old things have passed away. All things become new. And then, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden we don't have any sickness in our bodies. That doesn't mean all of a sudden that we don't have any more problems. Oh my goodness, the problems are just getting started. Because now, we're a target. The enemy does not want you to become born again. But how do you become born again? What is the process? The process is an omission of sin. I want to pray a prayer. All of you listening, would you just pray along with me? A pray a prayer of repentance before God. Perhaps you've already prayed a prayer of repentance. Perhaps you've already admitted your sin. You know, just pray again with me. Not that you need to be born again again, but because we can never repent before the Lord 
too many times. We can never thank him too many times for what he's done for us. Let's pray together. Father, all over the world, let's pray. Father, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the sin-atoning blood that he shed for my sins at the cross of Calvary. Because of his death and resurrection, I will never be the same. Thank you, Lord, for sending your son to die in my place. I deserve death, but through Christ you gave me life. I repent of my sin, and I ask for you to wash me clean with the blood of Jesus. Cleanse me of my sin. Renew me in my spirit. Quicken me in my heart. Help me to see the things that you want me to see in your word. Help me to follow after you all the days of my life. And when I die, please receive my spirit in your presence. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his death and his resurrection. I repent of all of my sins and receive Christ now. Come into my heart. Save me. Cleanse me. Renew me. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer, I would love, especially for the first time, I would love for you to share that with us in our question box. That's a private area. You can just shoot, shoot that over to us and just tell us you prayed that prayer. Or maybe you have fallen away from God. Maybe that's something that you haven't said in a long time, and you said it, and you felt the weight of the world lifted off of your shoulders. If you would, share that with us. We love your testimonies. Let me check our question box real quickly and see if there's anything here before we cut loose. I sure want to tell you that I appreciate everyone who is uh, attending tonight. Don't forget, Chris is standing by, 918-827-5764. 918-827-5764. If you need prayer tonight, simply call Chris. If you'd like to join the 300 Club, Simply call Chris, 918-827-5764. Thoroughly enjoyed having you this evening. I hope all of you have a blessed, blessed night, and we will see you next time right here on the JRMI webinars. Check us out online, www.jrmi.org.